So th- the fact that you, you just said the live stream thing, this is a good segue to another um, topic I wanted to talk about. Well, obviously, we'll focus on the boat, but you guys, you guys are the OG YouTubers, in a sense. Such OGs that we didn't know what OG meant for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> finally Sounds had like to they're ask. swearing at us. Yeah. No, OG. Hey, special quick announcement. Eastbjorn is getting a pretty extensive refit at Vindo on the west coast of Sweden, kind of as we speak. She's in the shed right now and going to be in till the end of January. And the first passage of 2024 on Eastbjorn, we are running as a delivery slash shakedown sale back to Bergen, her home port where August lives. That's going to start on February 24th. It is going to be a pretty gnarly winter passage. Um, It will not be nonstop unless the weather is absolutely perfect. We'll be able to coastal hop our way between Sweden and Norway and around the bottom of Norway, seeing some spectacular scenery on the way, learning some high latitude sailing from John Amtrip, who literally wrote the book called High Latitude Sailing. Uh, It's going to be a proper adventure. um, And that is uh, happening in February, like I said. So if you want to be the first people to sail on Eastbjorn after another refit uh, and participate in this pretty uncertain delivery slash shakedown first voyage on the boat back to Bergen. Check that out on the website. It's at 59-north.com slash 2024. And uh, we've got bunks available for that. So John hopes that you will join him on the delivery sale back to Bergen. Well, hey, friends, welcome back to On the Wind, the last episode of this season of the podcast. I'm your host, Andy Shell, and I actually am hosting this week. Before we get to this week's episode, a couple things that are going on. I am back in Sweden recording from Mission Control, my shipping container turned office that is overlooking the field with snow on the ground. Uh, Actually, I love winter. I'm delighted. I've got my fire running in the corner, and it's pretty nice to be back home uh, and back into my routines. Uh, This week, I recorded at the boat show with Paul and Cheryl Shard of Distant Shores. They've been on the podcast many times before. So if you haven't heard them before, I encourage you to go back and listen to that. This was cool because we recorded in person. We sat down in the living room of the house that we rented in Annapolis just to block up from the show and had a really nice catch up. They're uh, on their, I think, fifth boat, a pretty cool aluminum lifting keel sort of go anywhere boat. And uh, a lot of it was pretty cool. We we talked after the episode. Um, They're hoping to get up to Spitsbergen and they were asking what our experiences have been like up there. Um, I should have recorded that part, but uh, that was really fun to chat with them about that. And I having had just come from Greenland, was giving them some tips on 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 that sort of thing. Kind of weird to think that I'm like giving tips on high latitude sailing. I, I wrote an article for Yachting World about um, kind of that same theme that's in the, I think the current issue. And I I wrote this and I say this like I am not an expert at high latitude sailing at all. I've gone there a couple times in normal boats and got away with it. (laughs) It's how I think about it. Obviously, there was a lot of research and uh, planning going into those trips. But to think that people are asking me about it now feels uh, uh, awkward, uh, to say the least, because I am definitely not an expert at it. But there you go. Um, What's happening at 59 North? Well, uh, we have a couple trips. Uh, Me and I actually, one week from today, actually one week from yesterday, are flying to Portugal to do the last trip on Falcon um, together, which is great. We've still got those openings in January on the first two trips of the year. If you want to sail with us, there's one or two spots left, I think, on each passage. We've got a new skipper for next year, Emily Caruso, who is extremely well regarded in the business and good friends with uh, Nikki and Chris from the Clipper days. So she's going to be skippering that second passage of the year, which is very exciting. I'm really excited to have her on the team going forward. Um, and we'll be back with this podcast. Uh, we're going to start the next season, which will technically be the first season of 2024, even though it's starting in December. So we'll be back, uh, I think on December 12th, 5th, December 5th, we're back December 5th with the next episode of the season. So short break as we record more episodes and get ready for that season. And thanks to all of you for listening. And until next time, hold fast. On the Wind is supported this season by AG1, the daily foundational nutritional supplement that supports whole body health. I gave AG1 a try because offshore, eating balanced nutritional meals comes secondary to managing the boat, not to mention managing my sleep and seasickness. 
I drink AG1 as part of my routine in the watch schedule, usually before my first cup of coffee, and it makes me feel confident that I'm getting the nutrition I need no matter how the rest of my day's eating goes. I actually started drinking AG1 years ago as part of my fitness routine ashore before 59 North even existed, but now that I spend a big chunk of my time at sea each year, it's become an even more important part of my routine in order to maintain my overall health while my main focus is required elsewhere on the boat. I can cover all my nutritional bases for the whole day with one scoop of AG1 mixed in my water bottle each morning. It tastes great, makes me feel great, and it costs less than three bucks a day. If a comprehensive solution is what you need from your supplement routine, then try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash on the wind. That's drinkag1.com slash on the wind. Check it out. On the Wind is also supported by our very good friends, back again, Forbes Horton Yachts. We've had a fantastic relationship with Forbes over the years. He's been a friend of mine in Annapolis and a work colleague for many, many years. In fact, since long before 59 North even existed. Forbes is a sailor himself, so he understands boats. He understands offshore sailing especially. He and his wife took a Tartan 34 to the Caribbean and back back in the day. And uh, they still sail today on the Chesapeake. If you have a boat that you're looking to buy, whether or not Forbes is listing it, he can be your buyer's broker. Or if it's come time to sell your boat, he can, of course, list it and be your selling broker. Forbes is fun to work with. He's a really great guy, knows his stuff, and is not your typical blowhard broker. So check out ForbesYachts.com. That's F-O-R-B-E-S, ForbesYachts.com. And if you're around at the Annapolis Sailboat Show, he will be there at the X Yachts uh, exhibition, which is out on the docks out by the, uh, out by where the woodwind is. And you can meet us there. Um, we'll announce this later, but a couple times a day, we're going to fire the cannon out at Forbes's booth uh, with X Yachts. So go say hi to Forbes if you're at the boat show this year. And if you want to buy or sell your dream boat, check out ForbesYachts.com. Thanks again to Forbes Horton for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. You're listening to On the Wind, my podcast about offshore sailing. I'm your host, Andy Shell. Paul and Cheryl Shard of Distant Shores are truly the OG YouTubers, having filmed and produced videos of their sailing adventures for over 25 years. I met up with them in person at the Annapolis Sailboat Show a few weeks ago to talk about their transition from broadcast TV to YouTube and if that's changed their process. We also talked a lot about their new boat, a go-anywhere aluminum expedition yacht built in the Netherlands, which will launch in early 2024, and what they've designed into what is their fifth boat. You can follow Paul and Cheryl's adventures on distantshores.ca. Okay, we're rolling. You guys know how this works. I don't, I should have looked. I don't know how many times you've been on the podcast, but it's been a few now. Um, But I want to start. You... You at the you mentioned before we started recording the Toronto Boat Show, which is where I think we first met. Yeah, yes, long yeah, time ago. Mm-hmm. And you told that joke about building a boat for your friends and your enemy. <laughs> like, how <laughs> many steps can you take that now? Because you're on your fifth boat. Like, does that just like what, <laughs> how many boats do you have to build for your enemy before you build one for yourself? There well, you that, go. Yeah, that joke's supposed to be you build your first boat for your enemy and your second boat for your friend and your third boat for yourself. So I guess we're on our fifth, but I don't count it that way because I meant. That joke's meant to be when you actually make it yourself because you make so many mistakes on your own boat. <laughs> Hopefully we're making less now that we're buying them for a company that really knows what they're doing. So. Yeah. Is there something behind what you just said there in that the previous boats, the company didn't know what they were doing? Uh, we had some problems with uh, this, I guess, different problems with some of the boats. Mm-hmm. But uh, You don't have to go into it. You can tell me off, to the, off the record. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the new boat we're having, it built in the Netherlands and this is our first time uh, in the Netherlands to do a job like that. And it's been really interesting. I think I've really enjoyed it. I think the Dutch people all, for one thing, they all speak English. Like everyone mm-hmm. knows how to speak English. Mm-hmm. And they really want to say what they think. So they're not they being don't subtle. Hold back. They're not you know, being clever and subtle and not saying stuff. They want to, let's deal with it. This is an issue. It has to be done. 
If so they don't agree really with us, they will tell us. No worries about being yeah, polite. Which is something so. in, in Britain it tended to be, they'd be too clever and not wanting to hurt feelings or... So just a cultural thing. Well, I actually think this is a this is a great place to start because we just rebuilt Falcon basically, which mm-hmm. was effectively building a new boat except for the hull. And I think, without going into too many details, there is definitely a cultural thing. Like the guys that built the boat in England, they did a wonderful job. It wasn't without its hiccups. Mm-hmm. And we basically said as a business now, Eastbjorn just went into Vindo Marine on the west coast of Sweden. They used to build Vindo boats, the the you know the old they had like fiberglass hulls, but mahogany cabin tops. Yeah, they're gorgeous. So that yard still exists, but they don't build new boats. They just do refits and stuff. And we just said, n- never again are we going anywhere else for any major work than here because they yeah. they're the ones that refit Eastbjorn before our first Svalbard trip. Right. It's interesting. You had. I mean, I don't know if it's Europe in general. If it's just we got lucky with these yards. It's like it's KM, right? Uh, no, it's um, Angsail Yachts. Not KM. Okay. No. Competitor to KM, though, I guess. Yes. They're all they're in the that. S- I think they're the same ethos, and I think we would have done just as well with KM. Yeah. Well, we this started is- with KM, and we did a feasibility study with them. There was no obligation. We were just going through the process, which we thought was great. We'd never had that experience with another boat builder. And, you know, they came up with some really great ideas, but nothing was really what we wanted and the whole idea of this boat was it was going to be custom it was going to be everything that we've wanted over 34 years of cruising and it, they just didn't quite come up with what we wanted and then we discovered across the canal Anksail Yachts um, had just acquired the design for the Orion 49 and there's also a 54 design and it just seemed to have so many things that we already wanted. And it's much easier to start with something close to what you want and then make changes rather than starting from scratch or, you know, trying to really maneuver. And well, there's like that concept of like you can be more, almost more creative within certain limitations instead of just having a blank slate. Exactly. There's too many I was going to say that about your project. Well, yeah. That's, you had a, yeah. a not blank slate. No. <laughs> you had a performing hull already. Yep. And a rig, and you're probably not changing the mass position, but right, you know, you're trying to fit some changes to an interior, and we were kind of that's what we were doing. Now, I think we found that easier than it was kind of overwhelming to say, which we started with KM to start with kind of nothing. Then how do you produce? Well, we it was started too many with options. We started with a hull. Best fire, which are fabulous. Boats. That's my all-time yeah. favorite. Like the design, yeah. there, the that best of our fifty-three. I met. Gerard Dykstra on his ver- on his own boat yeah, we've sailed in on Iceland. His own boat. We've sailed on it. Oh, yeah, that's like that's the that's yeah. the yeah. that's they're so cool. Yeah, yeah. We, one of our it. videos on distant shores is you sail with Gerard and his wife out in the Netherlands. Awesome. Yeah, just so great. They sold the boat. What yeah. was the brief like when you started this? Did like did you have a two sentence elevator pitch that you went? Here's what we want: a pilot house boat that we could reduce the draft. To and like really steer from four and a half feet, whatever, and mm-hmm. really steer from inside, really be inside to take it up to north and be warm while we're sailing. Because we plan. took our southerly 49 to Norway and we were outside in foul weather gear the entire time. And I could not wait to get south to go to the tropics, <laughs> although I loved Norway and I'm so happy that we're going back because it's beautiful. Yeah. But now I'm going to be warm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And we were very inspired by your trip to Svalbard and the oh, documentary totally. you did with Delos. Cool. And, um, you know, seeing all that ice, uh, we thought, well, Paul's always wanted a metal boat, even before we built our first boat. But, you know, fiberglass boats are strong, they're more affordable. And um, so over the years, we've gone with fiberglass. But the, the real reason that we changed the boat when we did or decided to build the new one was the pandemic because suddenly the world shut down. We couldn't go where we wanted to go. We couldn't go anywhere. Our parents were having some health issues and it just seemed like a really good time to sell distant shores three, a great boat and, um, you know, fulfill our dream of doing a custom metal boat and, because we couldn't go anywhere anyway, it, we suddenly had this justifiable time period because custom boats take longer to build than production boats. So, well, yeah, I mean, everything takes longer <laughs> in <Yeah>. general, <laughs> but true. I guess that's, yeah, that's true. Um, so, 
so how and how far along are you now? This so this came out of COVID. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When did you like put down a deposit and commit like we're doing this? Was it June? Of- we started the build was really started like a year and a half ago, mm-hmm. nearly a year and a quarter ago. Yeah, and we started. And it's going it- to be finished in February. I mean, it's it's coming together now. The cabinetry is mostly done on the inside. Mm-hmm. Really interesting that they're building all the cabinetry outside the boat inside a mock-up that they built. That's cool. Out of wood. So yeah. there's all where the aluminum frame should be, there's wooden frames. Yep. Cut by the computer to be the same. And then they're building all the cabinetry off that. Because it it's all it, custom cabinetry. It makes it to know easy it fits. for the carpenters yeah. because they don't have to climb in and out of the boat every time to be working on this stuff. They, You know, it's on the shop floor. It's right there. Uh, it's all to measurement, and everything will fit in the hull. So, meanwhile, they w- while they were finishing the hull, they had already started the cabinetry, so we could be looking at it, making decisions and changes. Uh, it sped up the process, so they're hoping you know they'll be able to build an extra boat a year by doing this. And um, now the hull has been in the shop beside the mock-up. The hull's for finished and painted, and it's got all the interior plumbing is nearly finished and. All cool. the wiring runs and systems are going in pumps and toilets and stuff like that will be connected up yeah, soon. And, and as soon as they spray in the insulation, which is in a week or so, yeah. then they'll start moving the cabinetry in. How involved have you guys been and how many? How often did you like, are you able to make changes? Because like that was a thing that kind of slowed down our project because we had we had this vision for what we wanted, but we actually... We were making changes like right up to the mock-up stage, and it and they didn't have the what you're talking about building it externally. Everything was in place. The boat was in a shed. They had you know climb up mm-hmm. the ladder and then down to the where it was very time consuming. Mm-hmm. But how did that work? I mean, did they even allow you to make that changes, or did they just say, well, yes, but it's going to cost you this much money and this much time if you do this? How did that mm-hmm. How did that work? Yeah, I think there will always be a few things that are just going to be impossible at this stage, kind of thing. Or it'll cost a whole lot if we have to throw everything away that we've done. Mm-hmm. But in terms of how flexible they've been, it's really like a couple of weeks ago we were over there and they're saying, what about this? And then we go, okay, yeah, that's great. Or let's take that out and change the shape. So they're, or I want they're, an extra drawer. or And it they, doesn't cost anything usually. Yeah. It's like, well, because we, well, for instance, we had a just supposed to be a hull little bunk, a bunk, and you'd sleep there and that was it. Mm-hmm. So now we said, well, we don't really want that as a settee and then a bunk in the saloon. Instead, we want to turn it into a storage and a fireplace. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. So they said, okay, so storage and a fireplace. So something like this? Yeah, no, (laughs) maybe a little bit like this. Yeah, so that's fine. So off they go. And in the end, Mm -hmm. they decided it didn't really cost any more, so it wasn't worth charging for it. (laughs) Because they were going to have to have upholstery done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? Okay, it seems to me it might have cost a bit, but anyway. I wonder so that's it. Cost anything, so that cost it. thing's interesting that you say it that way because we've always suspected that the stuff we've had done at the yard in Sweden, they've charged us more on like, this is what it should cost. This is what you're going to pay, unless there's any giant surprises. Whereas other places, and I'm not saying, I'm not singling out England because that's where we did Falcon, but we've had the exact same issues here in the US, here in Annapolis. You just feel like you're getting nickel and dimed with every minute that someone's on the boat, whether it's. Yeah, it, it just didn't. It feels more fair in a way somehow. Yeah, the way they do it in Sweden, felt. and we it's really that. it's always felt like you look the guy in the eye and you say, "This is what we need to do." And we're not asking for a lot, but yeah. But if he said, you know, it would cost a bit more to do this, we would have said, "Sure." Because mm-hmm, they've been but, dealt with us so fairly in all, yeah. all things, and it's a lot of it. I, I think part to be fair, some of the stuff if if it's done up already and has to be done on the computer and they've done work already. But in this case, they were just saying it's going to be cabinets. Mm. So we know there will be cabinets, and we know cabinet unless you've asked for teak, something yeah. like some really expensive materials. Mm-hmm. It's just going to be wood, but arranged differently. And our guys love that kind of stuff. So the guys <laughs> like, really, we get to build a fun cabinet <laughs> instead yeah. of boring cabinets, like we often do. You know, so they're looking at this bit of a rolling piece of wood around the corner of a cabinet, and they go. I love doing that kind of stuff, you know. Like, yeah. And he's showing us here's how we cut this thing out, and yeah, and they're so proud of their work. And yeah. the team that's there have worked for Excel Yachts for many, many years, so that was a, a good feeling for us too. And we've um, started doing live streams when we go and check on the boat, and you know, just put them up on our YouTube channel. And we've had the carpenters do little demonstrations of the kind of work that's that so they're cool. doing. 
And so it's all very As we did with the welders, fun. the guys who were welding. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I made the actual first weld on the boat. <laughs> well, that's scary. I wasn't ready for They kind of <laughs> really. that up on me. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, they said, well, we're going to get started. Why don't you come over and see the beginning of the welding today? So we showed up, and then they like pushed me <laughs> forward. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, you are going to do the first weld on the boat. Jeez, I welded steel about 30 years ago. It's the last time I've done any welding. <laughs> wow. So we practiced on a little bit on the corner and yeah. made a little weld about uh, inch and a half. So long that's the one part of the boat we have to take responsibility for. That's cool. <laughs> so if the little tang falls off in the bow locker, that would. <laughs> yeah, seriously. They checked it over. Meanwhile, I was gonna say they when you guys left, they're just like, okay, it's put the real one in now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah maybe. I've seen it. I've looked. It's still there. <laughs> but nice. so the, the fact that you, you just said the live stream thing, this is a good segue to another um, topic I wanted to talk about. Well, obviously we'll focus on the boat, but you guys, you guys are the OG YouTubers in a sense. Such OGs that we didn't know what OG meant for a long time. <laughs> finally Sounds had like to ask. they're swearing at us. Yeah. No, OG. Hopefully it's not the old guys. It's the original, original gangsters. Ori- that's right. Exactly. For those of you in the audience that also don't know what OG means. <laughs> but like, have you, I mean, do you guys, are, are you participating in the YouTube yes. thing at the oh, boat yeah. show? Yeah, do you, yeah, do you feel a, a part of it? Like, oh, do you? Yeah, it's yeah. wonderful. It's a nice community. Yeah, because for so yeah. long when we were working in television, I mean, there are only one or two other production companies doing sailing. And so we really felt isolated. But now there's this you know, entire community of people that understand the difficulties of documenting the sailing lifestyle. And it's a very cooperative community. Like we're all wanting to do collaborations with one another. And now people that are dreaming of going sailing have the choice of different age groups and different budgets and different kinds of boats and it's wonderful we just find it so inspiring and and we love the energy of, of so this did you like did it take you did you embrace it immediately or was there any sort of like elbowing out like this is our territory sort of thing how, no, how did that no, evolve I, no, well, that. I think at the first part we didn't quite understand youtube yeah so we we got a YouTube channel back in 2009 or something like that when it was really young, but I didn't know and what we to were, do with it. We so we were still doing television. We made TV at the time, and that sent was the them, only thing you could do. Sent them out to the broadcasters yeah. and they would send us a check. Yeah, and then we send them some more. They send us another check, and, and there was a disconnect. Disconnect there, I guess, between you and the audience. Yeah, and we yeah, had, we couldn't we couldn't meet our audience except yeah. when we would do talks at yacht clubs and stuff. Or like mm. that. boat shows. Mm. Yeah. And and at boat shows, people would come up and say, "Hey, we see you on television," and then. YouTube came out, so we put s- just trailers up on YouTube. We used it as a, like a promotional vehicle for the television show. Yeah. Because when our TV show was at its height, we had we were in 47 million households. That's and wild. Even the, the biggest sailing channels now, like don't even come close to that. So, and they work so hard, like every Yeah, the but they weren't and, sailors. Like we could talk, conversely, yeah. we could talk to people and say we're on TV and they'd say where? And they'd say, well, you're, you're not, we don't get your channel. Yeah, mm. So, so that's when we realized channel, YouTube was so great is that literally anyone around the planet who could get any kind of connection to the internet could see our stuff. So that meant you could have all sailors watching if you wanted. And then it's a little easier. You don't have to make shows about that have a general interest, we could yeah. make it more to people who are interested in sailing and just For more television, specifically. For television, because of the mass audience, we had to focus on travel. So things that anyone could do and see, but the thread was that we got there by boat. So that was interesting. But sailors wanted more nuts and bolts. They wanted to know what bottom paint, how to fix the head, you know, that the general television audience We couldn't put be that interested. in a TV show. You know, like <laughs> yeah. Well, that, I mean, actually that raises another question is where like have you guys tried to plan episodes based on what you think the audience wants or what the production company wants how much of what's where's the balance between what you guys just want to film versus what you feel you need to film and how has that shifted between tv i mean you touched on it now a little bit between tv and youtube definitely shifted yeah for sure i mean we used to we were lucky i think the way we made our tv show that we could really film wherever we wanted to go just make like now we're going to sail to the Middle East, or we're going to sail to the Norway. The broadcasters or, gave us a lot of flexibility, and that and just make was something not the interesting. case with other travel shows. But we still had to bear in mind that the audience was a travel-related group rather than a sailing-related group. So we would try to do slip in historical interest and 
mm. visiting historical sites or trying local cuisine and stuff that as sailors we weren't necessarily that keen on, but it was still fun. Yeah, okay, yeah. So now we've shifted it to more or less just what we'd like to do. Yeah, and, and a little uh, and more nuts and bolts things that sailors want to. Uh, it's but have have you gone education. complete? Are you no longer on TV, broadcast TV no, at we all? Still have, uh, you we still put together yeah. broadcast episodes. In okay. fact, our agent is that the fall show selling the our con. license. Yeah, at Con, the Mick TV. Oh, wow. Uh, so it's still on AWE in the USA, and it's been on in the Middle East, Australia, New Zealand. Most of the world except the Pacific, I think. But so how do you but how do you divide like what they get versus what you get to keep on YouTube? That must be well complicated. We, we can use bits and pieces for each. Yeah. So we still do both. Mia, come say hi. But we take out <laughs> the. Huh? Hey, here's Mia. It's okay, Mia. It's not. We're not live. You can come and interrupt. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's not live. We're gonna cut. I this. didn't know who that walked this in. This is cool. Say hi, Mia. Hi. Hey. Hey. <laughs> How's it going down there? Good. Yeah? Mm-hmm. We're doing great. great. We're so happy to see you guys. I know. Are we not on camera anymore? We're, I mean, we're still rolling. We're still rolling. I'll, I'll, I'll cut this out. We're not. I yeah. probably won't. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. I understand uh, you're right. Bes- okay. What are you, are you home now? Or? No, I'm going to look at a few things. Okay. Can you shut the door? Yeah. Thanks. I forgot to do that. Sorry, you yeah. were saying that yeah, the, we, we the, sort of the mix. We do bits and pieces. So we'll go to a destination or a situation. And we'll film, and then for YouTube, we'll have more educational how-to, but still a bit of travel. And then we'll we'll have a lot more travel things with a little bit of like, cut out the bottom paint stuff. and stuff for the TV channels. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, is you have have you guys like monetized YouTube and figured out how that works, or do you still make an income from TV? Both, like, how I'm gonna mix the both of them. And what's the been the learning curve for like figuring out YouTube? Like, do you guys feel like you've figured that out? Oh, that would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> and it's always changing. We do monetize the channel, but we also do Patreon. We have a Patreon yep. group, which is fun. Because mm-hmm. I think both of those give us a real chance to meet the people who have supported, watch the shows, which we never had much except the person who got around to tracking us down and sending us an email or even writing us a postcard Yep. Mm-hmm. in the old days. And so now it's way cooler to be able to actually chat with people and get Yeah, we get so get many ideas from talking to our patrons and everyone at the boat show that we chat with. You know, what's in, interesting? What do they want more information on? And we love teaching. So, you know, there's a real high educational yeah. component to our YouTube channels, so not so much yeah. the television show. And that's fun. So like doing mm-hmm. graphics to do showing docking techniques and getting the drone out in the air and TVs change with more of these different technologies that we can use. That, yeah. That yeah. Are really we great used to, to when, a season for television was 13 half hour episodes and a half hour episode was 23 minutes, 50 seconds. Like it had to be exact <laughs> Dead on. because yeah. of commercials. Et yeah. And you know, We'd film for six months and come home with these tapes in our hands that we were so afraid would get, you know, destroyed on the way, backed up, but still. Um, and now uh, we can do everything on the boat. Everything's compact. Like we had big, giant shoulder cams in the old days, and now everything is just a lot easier. Um, but you but can get better YouTube, stuff. Like our new camera yeah. can shoot stars at night in a movie. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like the things we yeah. can do that we yeah. couldn't record before. And, practically Luminescence in the water yeah practically throwaway cameras that can you can take underwater where it used to be mm. it was a six thousand dollar rig that we took <laughs> underwater you couldn't Jeez. afford to get a leak yeah and anyway it was huge so now you tie it on the end of a boat hook and stick it underwater and you happen to get some pictures of dolphin <laughs> <laughs> youtube yeah. has meant so much more great options i think yeah. to get in touch with the audience and I think the the real thing we had to learn i mean the thing about youtube is you're supposed to be able to like be creative and do whatever you want to do, you know, but there's an expectation of things being a bit more casual and, and you're talking to the audience. We've always done that with our TV show, but you know, we have a TV voice and we have to pull that back a bit. What does that mean? Well, we're doing narration and here we are today (laughs) at such a, we're on YouTube. That just feels way over the top because people are used to vlogging where it's just somebody's diary. So you're diary. more, yeah, okay, more casual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the editing can be more casual and it can be any length. Like it doesn't have to be exact. Well, that was That is one 
that you can say absolutely about YouTube. It's hard to say anything absolute about YouTube, mm -hmm. but you can make it any length. Like your brother keeps saying how YouTube's are really, really short. And it's like, no, you watch short YouTube. YouTube <laughs> yeah. makes stuff that's 10 hours long. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. or one hour or half an hour or five minutes or 30 seconds. Or there doesn't seem, it doesn't seem to matter. No. I mean, same thing if with people talk. It, it will, they, they will they'll find really it. Well. Yeah. They'll find yeah. your market for I mean, they you. find the same thing with podcasting. Everyone says, I mean, some people say, oh, it's got to be a certain length. Whatever. You look at like Joe Rogan, his mm -hmm. are three or four hours yeah. long. Yeah. yeah. And like exactly. the hardcore history, that's three yeah. hours long an episode. And it's, yeah, that, I mean, that is pretty cool that the format can be whatever, whatever it needs to be kind of. Yeah. You, yeah. they will find your audience for you. And to me, it seems like they do a great job at that mm. yes and then yeah. it's a pretty fair deal that they mm -hmm. find some advertisers to support it and it's clear it's transparent like we will find the advertisers put them in you will make the show you get some money for for yeah, views of the ads it's, a, it's, it's kind of a clear straightforward thing and we find it's a very respectful relationship between yeah. youtube and I like YouTube creators they seem to you know really like to work with creators and be collaborative rather than you're the cash cow, like yeah, you know, yeah. So some social media sites. So so how like how do you feel about? I mean, I I actually I'm asking this genuinely out of curiosity because I don't. All the people that say with us watch YouTube, mm -hmm. and I am very much out of the loop. I know you guys. I know some other people, some friends that do it, but like I don't watch it. Mm -hmm. So, but how do you? It, but it feels to me like every year there's just more and more and more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How long can like is is do you think there's audience for all this? Is, or is this just going to be like if like how long can this go? And then how long can it? How long? I mean, you guys have been doing this for what? How many years now? Like TV, YouTube, we whatever. TV in ninety ninety seven ninety five. I guess we started doing yeah. the TV programs. Discovery nineteen ninety five. So I guess the question is like is 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 it sustainable? Both from a standpoint of can can there just be more and more channels, and is it sustainable for people to just keep doing this year after year after year? How do you keep it fresh and how do you, how do you keep it fresh and how do you f stay relevant? Do you think about that? Oh yeah, we do. There's always, I mean, new technology and new situations. We never seem to run out of ideas of things to cover, but I think that is because we talk to people directly a lot and engage with our audiences on social media. Well, and the comment but, section is always there to help you out, to let you know what, yeah. what you, how but you're doing, I, if people like it and keep mm. giving you the thumbs up. I mean, it really used to be there was, when we put our TV show on the air the first time, there was this mm -hmm. one other TV producer who did a sailing show about chartering and Sail that TV. was it. Sail. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted television first, if sailors wanted to see anything, the America's Cup would come out and it wasn't broadcast in Canada at all. Yeah. Sailors couldn't see that, but there were these two shows of our shows that you could see. Mm -hmm. And there was nothing else. And so now there's, I think it's helped to build the sport sailing. Mm -hmm. More people are getting into cruising and sailing because they can see a lifestyle mm. that looks a lot like them. Like if there's two uh, really young people who can't afford much of a boat at all, but they've, they've got going, the, that, mm -hmm. there's lots of those on YouTube these days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And other people of other ages, other situations, single people, people with families. There's yeah, a lot I, of pe people doing it in a different way and dogs and pe people <laughs> sail with dogs. And can you guys, sorry to interrupt, yeah. can you guys do a favor and move one seat this way? I'm just afraid that we're too close to the oh, camera sure. and I just oh. noticed that now. So if, the, if we apply this on YouTube, <laughs> speaking of, <laughs> and the first half we're too close and you're only seeing me, well, that's my fault. Um, so I personally <laughs> think there's abundance for all. I think there is so many different variations on the channel, on the channels, um, on YouTube. And I think, as Paul said, you, people find their, their group. And I can't believe the amount of time that people spend watching sailing YouTube. So yeah. You know, it's I mean, every we, like investment in time. Well, we decided to put our booth right next to the YouTube booth this year. Cause we got to know Jeff who organizes that. And, We've sort of kind of like not deliberately kept it at arm's length, but we've never decided to do it ourselves mm -hmm. for for specific yeah. reasons. We can't. It's too much to run the trip and do the customers. And yeah, so it's a lot of fuss. But we thought like, well, e literally every single person that sails with us watches YouTube. Mm -hmm. So there's got to like we're just if nothing else, it'll be fun people watching down there at the at the booth this year. And it, it was kind of an experiment. Is there a crossover? We've done the stuff with Delos. Mm -hmm. We have an, another thing coming out in January with uh, James the Sailor Man, James Frederick, oh, who okay. solo sails at Alberg yeah. 30. He sailed with me to Greenland. 
and uh, made is going to make a couple of movies out of that. Um, so it's yeah, I, I think it's fascinating, and uh, but I am curious if, if it's like sustainable, and also is is the like is the few people, and maybe it's more than I think, but the people that are actually making a living on this is that giving like a false sense of like hey, I can do this too and go and make a living at this. It's hard to make a living. YouTube is difficult to make a living at, but then mm -hmm. you've got Patreon to make, add into the mix and mm -hmm. that provides more income than the YouTube thing yeah, in general. Yeah, and I mean, if you have a big platform, it's not so much that you're earning from views, but you can earn from sponsorship because mm -hmm. you have a big platform to share you know, product information and so on with. But, um, and I know a lot of YouTubers worry about the competition for views um, and that things are becoming saturated. But I really, I think it, it's self-generating. It's like the more channels mm. there are, the more channels people seem to watch. And Interesting. Yeah, that's there's my more, impression. Yeah, there's I more things you. available. No, I, I kind of, I agree with that in a way. Yeah. But I see what you're saying is you can't, if it's growing exp like tremendously, obviously there's a point where it st has to stop mm -hmm. growing. It might level off, but it might also find a normal sort of a, a level, mm -hmm. a new level, a new normal kind of higher up than mm -hmm. sailors ever used to have. I mean, yeah. you, you probably remember years ago when, when you're a kid, you're looking at those paper magazines and so you'd yeah. wait to get your paper magazine in the mail and read about sailing and... And, and now there's just so many more options to there's learn blogs about stuff. And vlogs. Well, not just that, but like in the magazines, I mean, I, it was always the same. And, and ironically, it's, it's still the same dozen people or so that pop up. And now it's sort of splintered. Now you have like the old media where it's still the same people. And then you have YouTube where it's a whole bunch of new people that mm -hmm. are different. And you don't have this. It's classic media thing. There's no gatekeeper on it anymore, yes. right. which I think is very cool. Yes. It is. I think it. There's problems to that, but there's also, like what? Also, well, sometimes you, you you could create something that isn't doesn't have the truth in it. Like you, you could make a. I guess you could make a fictional YouTube channel. I suppose, and that's what some people. Well, maybe you're worry thinking about, about like a lot of uh, products get reviewed that haven't really been tested long term, hmm. and Where an followers editor would trust the creators of the old process had an editor at the top who said fred you're good at this stuff you go and do that and then when the stuff came back from fred they would look mm -hmm. over it and say maybe you should have someone else review this before we put our magazine stamp of approval on this kind yeah. of thing and now that doesn't exist anymore so right. that, that seems to be a potential problem mm -hmm. but i think the audience is also aware of that yeah so they understand a little bit about how it works mm -hmm. but yeah. i think all of us and including mia are fortunate in that we kind of bridge those two groups because you've yeah. written for many years mm. for magazines. We have two and we're still doing television, but we embrace the new media and the new community of, of young sailors, which is fantastic because when we first started sailing, people were really worried that young people wouldn't be interested in sailing. Sailing and was going to die out. Mm. I remember people yeah. saying that. Watching they their still magazine. say it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, maybe but they do. Now, do, you, do you feel that? Do, do I feel that it's dying out? dying out? Uh, I just think, I mean, some version of it is, yes. Like some, like things like, because it's changed, right? Mm -hmm. I, it's not dying, it's changing. Yeah, I think sure. that's that's everything. And some things are stopping and some are not. And I don't, but but no, I don't. I like, especially with young people, they're just it's just not as visible. I mean, I think, I talked to John Kretschmer about this, actually, mm -hmm. the last time he was on the podcast about like, I asked, actually asked him, yeah. do you feel like you are part of the quote unquote sailing industry? Mm -hmm. And he kind of said, well, no, but not no at the same time. Mm -hmm. And the idea, I think like, because you, you go to shows like this and everything is bigger and more expensive. I mean, even like, I even thought yeah. of the, the boat you guys are building. We're talking about what is unattainable for most mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, like if the market, if the industry keeps going, I mean, us too, I and mean, we yeah. charge a fortune for our yeah. trips. Yeah. So like, we're not going to attract the young people because they don't have that kind of money. Mm -hmm. um, so I think they're just they've just gone elsewhere. Not that they were ever here to begin mm -hmm. with. Like I don't necessarily think that a show like this was ever attracting. It was always yeah, about sales. making money. It's yeah. a, it's you know it's. So I think it's. I think it's more like that. Um, yeah, there's but the shows like the the Umas are busy rebuilding. Dan and Kika are busy rebuilding their yep. their old the boat that they got practically. They overspent on it for three thousand bucks. It wasn't more than about <laughs> thirty eight fifty on the, the, the day they got it. 
But you know, now they're rebuilding it, turning it into something else. And, and other people are doing that amazing too. Places. And you can still go in and get that kind of boat, like that's been in charter for ten years, yep. and now it's out of charter. Mm-hmm. And and those are available thanks to the charter industry. Yep. There's a huge pile of those boats coming out that you can put your own sweat into and turn it into something. And so mm-hmm. those people are still adopting those boats and, and sure. growing with that if you want and, to do it for low budget. And I think too that there's a, uh, like been a little bit of a skew in the perspective in that before everyone was like older, retired, you know, later in their careers when they could afford to buy boats and go cruising. And we worried about young people getting into the sport. Well, now, with all the sailing channels, I mean, they're mostly shot by 20 and Mm 30-year-olds because they're good at video and social media. They want to work and earn their living. And now with technology, they can cruise and still work on their boats. And now we get emails going, I'm 40 years old. Am I too old to go cruising? And it's like, <laughs> no, no. they're watching all the YouTubes. And there's yeah. The, the, yeah. It's the, yeah, yeah. still hmm. older people retire that have money. They don't make YouTube videos because too they don't work. need to work. <laughs> YouTube is too much work. And they're just out enjoying things. So, so um, yeah. Does it feel like work for you guys? There's parts of it that are work. What, like what? I mean, well, all the editing takes a long time. I like that. It's but it's work though. You're do you do the, all of it yourself, or do you guys have a team that helps? We don't have nobody. No, just we've us. tried to have. We've tried, but it's so much our own voice. Yeah, that it's been ended up more work, and we love it. I mean, I, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not complaining yeah. about the work. I mean, I, I didn't mean that. Mm. I love doing it, but yeah. it is work. Like you have. So to, how do you define work? What it so what makes it what makes it, it's just well shooting this stuff is half the time the shooting and the sailing and the adventure we do I wouldn't really call work. We just have to remember to to film it. Okay, because you're doing it anyway. You just have to anyway. remember to get the <laughs> camera. There's anything that's, I could do. That's a pretty funny way to put it. Actually, <laughs> yeah. I'm having so much fun, even though like it's a shitty day and we're crashing around, or whatever. <laughs> but getting the camera out sometimes. But the work comes later when you assemble all of the all the clips and put them into a massive bin on huge drives. But and that's fun too. You love it all is that fun. Well, that, but work though, it looks like work because look, you're sitting at a desk, you have a big monitor, hopefully I have a big monitor with some studio speakers and, and, yeah. and now a, we're an here working at the boat drives. show. And but how I, hard is that? Well, I, but I'm just mean the, the editing Everyone's is because the editing takes three times as long <laughs> as the shooting. At yeah. Least. So my, a fr- my, one of my best friends from high school and I, we had a very similar conversation about like, do you, do you feel like you work really hard? And like, how do you define hard work? Because I do like, I think maybe culturally work is like negatively, but it's a negative connotation. But what you're saying is like, it can be both. It's work, but yeah. it's also enjoyable. Yeah. And I, and so, so then, so then what makes it work? And I think what makes it, I think what makes it work is it requires a certain amount of effort to make it good. Yes. yes. Okay. Like yes. Yes. I'm struggling sometimes writing the script. What is the what is how to make this more interesting and cut it shorter? I've watched it and it's some nice shots in there, but it's an hour long and it needs to be about two minutes. So <laughs> yeah, so there's a lot of cutting, and I'll try some techniques to make it better. And now I got to find some music to put in there, and yeah. and then we, the sound needs work, so I need to fix up the sound because it's all crappy. And we do <laughs> maybe a lot you're of gonna previews. Loop it and, we have a. A, a number of preview audiences and individuals, some that are sailors, some that are not. So you do like like uh, test screenings? Yeah. Oh, yeah, wow. Not. And even in our neighborhood, um, they have a community center. And in the winter, we'll preview our shows for our neighbors. And they have learned that we really do want criticism because we'd rather hear from them than, you know, a TV audience or something. But... Um, yeah, that helps us break things down and and tighten so things up. So, what's an example of how of how they like what criticism they give you? Oh well, we can feel watching an audience if a segment we've created is too long, like they get okay. a little fidgety, and um, and we get attached to the footage, like because maybe it was really hard to shoot, the weather was bad, or yeah. you know whatever reason. So we really want to use that footage, darn it, and but it makes the story too long, perhaps. Well, there's behind that. Behind that tree is a lion. That's one of my favorite ones. <laughs> yeah. wait, what do you actually have, right? You have <laughs> wait, wait, wait. What has a just, tree? Behind that tree is a lion? Yeah. Wait, what does that mean? On a podcast, that's exciting. Okay. Right? You can picture On the video, lion. it's not. It's a tree. <laughs> okay. But behind it... You don't it, see the lion. There is I a lion, see. but you I can't get it. see it. So 
So, so it doesn't what you exist. have is a shot that doesn't have a lion, <laughs> but it does have a tree. And we and saw that's the it. lion. And we saw you the saw lion. the so lion. We are but... so excited. We want to tell the story, but it, it hardly works as television because it's a picture of a tree. The visual. Huh. So, so if you don't have the shots, it didn't happen as far as video yeah. goes. But um, So sometimes you know, we lose some cool things. We yeah. have to take some pieces out that just aren't as exciting as it should have been. And and honestly, that's one of the great things about nowadays with so many disposable, semi-disposable mm. cameras. You can get that shot. And you would probably have the line cam yeah. permanently mounted behind the tree just to make sure you got the little guy. Right. So. <laughs> some of the other things we get critiqued on are audio. You know, if it's too loud or the background music's too loud, too soft. If we find we preview it three or four times and we keep getting the same questions about a segment, we know we need to add information. So we'll add some narration or... Or take the whole thing out sometimes. Yeah, we do that too. And um, Paul's Paul's grandmother now passed, but she was great at, you know, if it was too loud, she would tell us. And Paul's <laughs> mom is like grammar police. If we, if our grammar wasn't perfect, she would tell yeah, us. Yeah, this is more at TV. Luckily, yeah. YouTube is more forgiving. Yeah, and yeah, more yeah, stuff yeah. In there. Mm. But um, no, and uh, people often ask us, does it ruin our pleasure of cruising that we're working with video? And absolutely not, we find, because... It enriches our experience. I was just going to say that. It's probably the opposite. Yeah, it yeah. is exactly the opposite. Because yeah. you're thinking, you're thinking like, I, I could just say, have a nap, or we could go and try to film, get some great shots of the back of the island or something, and get the drone in the air. And, and then when you get there, there's something happening, and you got yeah, some more and film. Because we, you we are have thinking be... about the audience. We, we haven't got enough interesting show, interesting stuff to make a show. So let's go get it. Mm. And that's the... It isn't, again, it's not work because it's fun, but it w- wakes us up to think, yeah, we really should get some more stuff happening. And we have to make the effort happening. to talk to people yeah. that we might, might well, not. Well, this is almost do. along the lines of the theme of like, you have a boat that's got a design already. So you have a, like, if you could just do anything out cruising, you might end up doing nothing and sitting on your boat at anchor and scrolling your phone. Mm-hmm. Um, but now you have a reason to like get out and actually see things. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, and we true. find... We have a sense of ownership about a place because we've created something about it. We've filmed it. We've told the story. And we find um, family cruisers, people cruising with kids, have the same feeling because they're trying to use the experience around them to teach lessons to the children they're homeschooling or people who are doing websites or blogs or podcasts. Uh, you know, you you experience things in a, a richer way, I think. So we really never get tired of it in fact if we go somewhere off the boat and we don't have a camera we get itchy and always something happens (laughs) of course we always have a spontaneous festival yeah yeah yeah. which is wonderful what i was gonna say what's your favorite tech advance like maybe maybe two questions like what's the, the thing that's made life easier and then what's your like favorite just for it's fun to play around with I guess the tech advance is the phone because it's just it, it is good enough to put it on broadcast television, mm-hmm. but it's always ready to go. It's in your pocket. It's waterproof. Water. It's waterproof enough mm. that if you get some spray on it, you can just rinse it, and it's always there. So it's hard to have the excuse anymore that you missed something because you didn't have a camera. Because mm. it used to be this big old lugging camera, that, shoulder cam that you know. And people would say, "What is that? Carry you're not allowed to come everywhere. into the church because you're carrying." That yeah, camera. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have a permit for <laughs> yeah. that. Well, it's my phone. <laughs> But I guess there's a lot of amazing tech that helps a lot. Yeah. The drone you're trying to make footage the, is fabulous. Well, I was going to say the drone, but the drone is also includes an amazing stabilizer, and that's one of the coolest things, mm-hmm. to be able to steady up footage, the improvements to capture the footage. The shots we shot, like of us with this window behind us, mm-hmm. the, fo- the phone and uh, modern cameras will sort the light out. Yep. It's very complicated. It would have taken a long time to, to make this yep. these shots correctly yep. with the old gear, and now the new gear is kind of like a camera with AI already operating it to try to get what you wanted. And that's mm-hmm. fantastic. The same with the sound. The, the newest things are taking out the sound problems too. As in like background noise, yeah. wind noise, stuff like that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, that's amazing. How do you guys record sound? Um, my new favorite, one of these little road little mics. Yeah. So there's a couple of those that beam towards something that can the be... The little square yeah, the wireless little square ones? ones? Yeah, yeah, I have a set They're of them too. Cute. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
but you know, with a little fuzzy on them, or I, we can use that the wind for recording jammer. the wind jammers on them. Mm-hmm. So that's we have really a shotgun cool. mic. Yeah, on the, the shotgun camera. mic. Big shotgun camera. mic with the fluffy, but we've had that for the last twenty years. So we've always <laughs> had a big, huge shotgun mic with a fluffy on it for the best outdoor stuff. Yeah, but the portable ones that are multiplexing the two channels together and putting them on. So that's that's fantastic. Yeah. And, the and we have up. some great shots of dogs yeah. who love the wind jammer on the microphone like the and they jammer. just like what leap at them <laughs> like they're a squirrel or something. Oh, wow. So we have some Look really close up shots. Emma, yeah, Emma Looking just around. perked up. Dogs? You talking <laughs> yeah. about me? <laughs> so how do you guys, do you feel, I asked this earlier, um, the question of like, how do you stay relevant like with, with everything? Do you guys think about that? Um, Especially, I mean, you guys have been doing this for so long that maybe you don't have to, but h- how do you stay relevant it's in a particularly crowded space? And not, you know what I mean? Like, how do you stay fresh? How do you stay relevant to your audience? And how do you guys keep what you do fresh? I guess our audience has changed. So as we've got a little older, we know that we know that many of the people who are out sailing nowadays are our age too. So, so that gives us an that edge, us actually. An how old are you guys now, anyway? I just turned 64 yep. a couple of so days the, ago. We're the same age. Yeah. 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 But that's an age that many people are getting to the point in their lives that they're just going to retire and do what they've been dreaming of doing. And mm-hmm. a lot of the people have dreamt of sailing and mm-hmm. traveling the world. And it kind of feels like yeah. we fit in. Whereas before when we started sailing, we were 29 and nobody was doing that. None of our friends mm-hmm. were doing that or none of our friends were dreaming of it either. Yeah. So we're kind mm-hmm. of relevant to our group, I think. Yeah, our group's as, grown with us and... As I say, there's not many channels our, of people hosted by people our age. And since most of the people sailing long term are our age, that does give us an advantage because we have a lot of experience, yeah. as you do. And, um, and they just relate to us <laughs> because, yeah, yeah. you know, of our yeah. age and our experience and and how do you guys keep it fresh? Like back to the new boat, you talk about going high latitudes and stuff. How do you guys decide like where you're going to cruise? That's well, what we get interests inspired us. Inspired by talking mm-hmm. to friends, we we talked to Yeah, Dan you and, inspired us. You inspired us <laughs> about the north and then we talked to Dan and Kika and about they did the from similar sailing trip Uma. from sailing Uma. They did the similar trip. Yeah, August actually interviewed them on their way north in Bergen on their boat, I think. Oh, in oh, his oh. backyard, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah, they're lovely. They're great fun. They'll, mm-hmm. they'll come and s- we're gonna convince them to come sailing on our new boat while mm-hmm. they're still. Oh, cool. While theirs is ripped to shreds. Yeah, like yeah. <laughs> so. And if you weren't so busy, we. I well, no. Too. So <laughs> actually, I so you 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 preempted me because I was gonna like I was gonna ask if I can come along because one of my goals next year, and I've already asked. So Pride of Baltimore, uh, I have this set up with them. I I realized like. It's been a long time since I've sailed under someone else mm. from like a learning, like an, like yes. we have this apprenticeship. You guys met Shia yeah. here. Like I want to, I want to do that now. I want to be an apprentice under somebody else. Like yeah. I, I just think there, there's so much to learn on from other people, and just to be a, to be not in charge. Yes. <laughs> like yeah. I, I look forward yeah. to that. So well, definitely. please, the if there's an opportunity, I would love to do that. Well, it's going right. to be a fun trip. We're really looking forward to it, and would like. Do you to already have a plan? Uh, not really, just loose ideas. I mean, I got from talking to Dan and Kika about what time of year we would head north. And, mm. Although they did something completely different because they went north sort of the previous fall. Yeah. And then just stopped up in near, not Tromso, somewhere up there. Yeah, Lofoten maybe. Yeah, in that general vicinity. Yeah. Hung out and then in the spring, as soon yep. as they could get going, they started. So. Yeah. So, so our plan is for. to be up in that area around June. And so we have most of the summer... How, what's the schedule like so when the boat's being built how, is there time there must be time for like sea trialing oh, yeah. and warranty stuff how long is that period that supposed is to be shrinking period <laughs> <laughs> <At this point. laughs> yeah i understand as building that. is slowing down a little bit or not slowing is has been delayed there's a little bit there's been supply issues and so yeah. on but so. february they're talking february now and you can sail in holland oh sure you can year. sail in february no so. we did our sea trial in january in the english channel yeah. so <laughs> yeah that'd okay, be good. that's a probably good, good, good to for hear. it too good to hear. Yeah. it was it was gnarly yeah we we, we really put it through its but paces that's useful that's no it was very useful yeah flat day and just motoring around i mean i asked that because like 
like we've had Falcons been we we basically knew this going in, but we got so delayed. We we had Paul this all planned out. Both going to be done in October. We'll have three months to mm-hmm. see trial before the first trip, and now we ended up having about three weeks. So we just said, okay, guys, the whole first year, that this is treat the whole year as a sea trial. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we're finally now, the boat has two more trips left. She's in the Azores now. And we've worked out most of the kinks. And now the refit or the off season will be just mm-hmm. kind of routine maintenance. Actually, stuff. a friend of ours is on that trip. Oh, yeah? Just arriving. Yeah, Noel. Wait, on with us or in the Azores? Yeah. With no, with you guys. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, wow. We've been tracking him on your huh. tracker. <laughs> cool. Well, that's <laughs> yeah. neat. Yeah. So anyway, how, so how much time do, like will you stay in the Netherlands? I guess. Well, from whenever they get in the water, which is hopefully February, mm. until we have to leave, which is sometime in May, I guess. How complicated is the boat, like systems-wise? I don't think it's that complicated, really. It's got a hybrid drive; is the most complicated. Yeah, that's oh, the new thing. cool! Mm-hmm. How did which? What did you do? What did you get? It's co- been, the ahead. company is called Combi, and they've done a bunch of hybrids. So this will be their first one they've done for a sailboat. So. They look That'll after, the right now, part. their uh, main customers are the canal boats in Holland. Cool. But they've been beta testing on a sailboat in Turkey for the last year, and we're working with them to beta test this as well. So there's, we actually thought there was going to be some delays with that, but they, we'll see. they've pulled it together. How, so how is it? Is it like, how is it hybrid? Is there an electric motor like at the gearbox on the engine, or yeah. is it... Yeah, the, there's an electric motor in parallel. So it's yep. called a parallel hybrid. Yeah. So that the engine, normal engine can drive straight through a shaft. Yep. Or you can, in, you know, spin the uh, shaft, disengage the pr- transmission and spin the shaft with the electric motor. To, can you make electricity yes. sailing through it as well? Yes. So That's make cool. Make electricity sailing, which is what I have some high hopes for. Spinning the prop and using that to regenerate yeah. power mm-hmm. well that's How what we'll actually get out of that i'm not sure but i wanted to do that same thing on falcon Be- beta marine had a guy that was doing the exact same thing a parallel hybrid mm-hmm. plugged into a beta engine but it was so much more expensive and it was just one yes, guy it doing it the timing was yeah. it was just like okay let's let's skip that <laughs> we looked at that too yeah yeah and, and the timeline was going to be that's very cool, so though. So it was fun to be involved with this. Yeah, but it project. does have a bunch yeah. of pluses. I mean, having an enormous battery bank, comparatively, not yep. not compared to a car, like it's like half the size of a car's electric battery bank. Yeah, mm-hmm. but having a big bank to be able to absorb power when you're regening, mm-hmm. I think, is one of the biggest pluses because now we have a big battery bank in the boat. Yeah, that gives you other options, like you can anchor for two days and not, or three days and not even worry about running. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a generator or anything like that, and still do everything yeah. you want on the boat. How big is the battery bank? It's about thirty kilowatts. Yeah, and we're working. What is that in amps? My brain doesn't work in kilowatts yet. <laughs> um, you mean amp hours? Yeah, 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 yeah. Like it. So I like if we if you convert that to twelve volts, what's that? Thirty kilowatts divided by so three thousand watts divided by twelve, right? Thirty thousand watts. Thirty thousand watts. Yeah. Divided by twelve <laughs> is about. 2,500. Okay. Yeah. 36,000 would be four. <laughs> we have Whatever. A lot this of, is math yeah. geniuses here. We have a Obviously. lot of super B we have batteries. a lot of friggin' batteries. <laughs> Did you, so are you doing like induction cooking, cooking then? Electric yeah. everything? Yes, yeah. 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 GNS pass induction. They made our stove as oh, well. Yeah, I wish they had made, and maybe if they're listening, <laughs> I think the perfect solution would have been an induction, a uh, gas cooktop and an, electric oven is what oh, I wish they had made. Cause we decided we went through okay. this whole thing cause we have yeah. lithium, a big lithium bank on Falcon mm-hmm. and, but it's not a 12 volt boat though, is it? It's 24 volt. Yeah. Um, but doing the math, it's like, okay, we can spend a week at anchor and not, not charge mm-hmm. if we have propane and the boat already had, you know, back to like the, what are we building into had dedicated propane lockers for four of those giant tanks. Right. So like we have propane for the year. Yeah. So 2,500 amps. There you go. So 25 at 12 equivalent, 12 volts, 2,500. Yeah. So Falcon, we have 2000 at 12 volts equivalent yeah, amp hours. A fairly much bigger boat, isn't it? A 60 footer? 65. 65 yeah. is way bigger boat. Mm-hmm. Um, but we opted not to do the induction because that was the single biggest draw and we could get like yeah. stretch the anchoring time out longer and it's worked out, um, but I, I do wish that they made a hybrid stove where That's you could do because, yeah, like, could, you don't use the oven that often, and an electric oven is so much better than a gas oven. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, gas oven is frankly a little scary too. 
Like, well, yeah, <laughs> get a big woof every time you go. <laughs> but, but, but that company, GNE yeah. Space, yeah. however you yeah. say it, they were awesome. Like, yeah, they did our whole, we, we have the stove, we have the, the sinks, everything's like, Tied oh, together, you integrated. Got the galley system. Oh, you got the galley. Oh, sure so it is so cool. <laughs> yeah. All the storage in the galley, even the drawers are designed around those trays yeah. that all fit in the sink and everything's all integrated. Yeah, you got the it's, strainer and everything. Yes, oh. it's very cool. He loves that. I covet it's very cool. your galley system. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. did you want to ask me? We're, this is, I mean, we could go, we could go forever. But did you want to? You said you wanted to ask me about high latitude stuff. Did you want to do that on the podcast, or should we do that after we're done? Uh, we can do it after, I guess. Cool. I don't know if everybody wants to hear that, but uh, I, I definitely want to hear it. But that might be more interesting. <laughs> I want to be well, taking notes instead of holding this microphone. Yeah, that's fair. Cool. <laughs> yeah. um, well, what, what, are you guys around all week? Yes. What's the plan at Bocho? Not that this will be out. This won't be out until oh, after Bocho. Oh, but sure, I'm curious yes. anyway. What do you what are you doing this week? Uh, Thursdays. We're, we're talking just to people filming. at the Bocho booth at the. Uh, we're at the Sailing the Channel. Cruisers creating content booth. Yeah, sailing Channel booth. Friday from noon to one, and Sunday from three to four, and then Saturday and Friday we have our Patreon meetups. We split them up because oh, cool. people come different days. Where yeah. are you doing those? Um, we're. Keeping Good. that a secret. Well, it's okay. <laughs> it, this will. It, it's yeah, fine. You, you can tell me off the, the mic. No, no, keep no. using the same place That's every cool. year, so it won't stay a secret. No, yeah, yeah, just, yeah. We're going to Middleton. Yeah. To, oh, nice because one. Because it's right by the yeah, entrance. Yeah. You know, yeah. So yeah. people can kind of come and go as they want. Yeah. But cool. Um, yeah. Well, I'm excited to see. I mean, I, I think I was in touch with you. I almost came down to Amsterdam to see the boat oh, in really? the shed when I was there. I wanted oh. to to see if we could work it out because it's not far for me with living in Sweden, but it didn't work out. But I'm. Are you going to Mets trade or? No, but Adam, our bosun, I think is. Oh, okay. Are you going to be there? We're yeah. going to be there. I'll, t- yeah. I'll connect you guys because he, he's awesome. Oh, and okay. I've been yeah. connecting him with other people that I know are going to be there, but I'm not, I'm not going to go this yeah. year. Yeah. Okay. I've never been, actually. I went last year for the first time. And it, is it cool? Uh, it was amazing. Yeah. It's yeah. a great show. Cause There's it, different people come. Like, the like It's a business to business, the, really. So yeah. there aren't salesy type people at the booths. It's mm-hmm. a, full of knowledgeable engineer type and people who run the company so you can really get real information about the different all those products on boats and there's no boats it's all just yep equipment, equipment. stuff yeah which is uh pretty yeah, but good we'll us. be we'll be going a few days before the the show to check on distant shores four yeah because that's then, just an hour drive north yeah yeah from yeah. where we are down to in Mets. Yeah. Mm-hmm. cool well this is great always nice to see you guys again oh, thanks for coming likewise. back on the show thanks for having us thank great you time. so much Andy. thank you Big thanks again to Forbes Horton Yachts for sponsoring this episode of the show. If you want to buy or sell your dream boat, go to ForbesYachts.com. That's F-O-R-B-E-S, ForbesYachts.com. Thanks also to AG1 for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. To get your free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase, go to DrinkAG1.com slash on the wind. That's DrinkAlphaGolf1.com slash on the wind. On the Wind is the podcast about sailing, created by 59 North and hosted by me, Andy Shell, and also by Nikki Henderson, August Sandberg, Emma Garshagen, and occasionally Ben Doer. The show is mixed and produced in Frederick, Maryland by Lee Cumberland. Ads are read by us, the hosts, and occasionally by 59 North's bosun Adam Brown and podcast producer Lee Cumberland. Episode artwork and website show notes are done by Laura Parent in San Francisco. The intro theme music is composed and performed by former podcast guest, musician, and sailor Cameron Dale, while the outro music you're hearing now is, of course, by our friends in Bergen, the Stormweather Shanty Choir. We love hearing from our fans, so send your questions and comments to holdfast at 59-north.com, and please do us a favor and review the show on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Until next time, hold fast. I made up me mind that I was inclined to go to sea no more. No more, no more, to go to sea no more. I made up me mind that I was inclined to go to sea.
As I was walking down the street, I met sweet Angeline. She said, Come home with me, me lad, and we'll have a cracking time. But when I awoke, it was no joke. I found I was all alone. My silver watch and my money too And my whole bloody gear was gone Was gone, was gone My whole bloody gear was gone It was when I awoke it was no joke For my whole bloody gear was gone as I was walking down the street, I met Big Rapper Brown. I asked him if he would take me in, and he looked at me with a frown. He said, Last time you was paid off with me, you talked up no score. But I'll take your advance and I'll give you a chance to go and to see once more. Once more, once more, to go to see once more. I'll take your advance and I'll give you a chance to go to see once more. Sometimes we're catching whales, me lad, but mostly we get none. With a twenty foot oar in every pour from five o'clock in the morn. And when daylight's gone and the night's coming on, we rest up on our oars. I know, boys, you wish that you was dead or snug with the girls ashore. Ashore, ashore, or snug with the girls ashore. Oh, boys, you wish that you was dead or snug with the girls ashore. Come all you seafaring lads that listen to me song When you go a big boating boys make sure you do not go wrong You take my tip when you come off a trip don't go with any horns but get married instead and have all night in bed and go to see no more. No more, no more to go to see no more. Get married instead and have all night in bed and go to see no more. No more. see no more get married instead and have all night in bed and go to see no more